For 2,000 years, believers have come together and greeted one another on this resurrection day with he is risen, he is risen indeed. Don't let me down. I don't want this to be the first congregation in 2,000 years to not do it the right way. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I want to welcome you to this place of worship. Glad you're able to be with us. Also want to thank those of you who are joining us uh, uh, through Stream Television and the Armstrong Channel. Thank you for, for being with us. We, we never underestimate what it's like to have you be part of our church family. Um, no matter what your situation is, thank you for joining us this day. Just a couple of things for the sake of the congregation to, to make sure. Um, we are under, under, um, under demand course through the annual conference to announce that the, on the 23rd of September, the second vote for the congregation, which will be uh, voting to ratify the agreement with the conference trustees on disaffiliate. Well, forgive me. If you wait till September, you'll be way too late. <laughs> Thank you. I think I've done that before here. So. April the 23rd at 6.30 in the evening. And uh, uh, more, inform you know, more information, if you have questions about that, we'll gladly fill you in on that. But uh, that's gonna be a church for the, and, and that's really designed to be a, a vote for, for members that are in good standing, and I'll let you decide if you're in good standing as a member. So that's the way that will work when that time comes. So keeping that before you. Also, this uh, Thursday, we have, uh, since during COVID, so many things had to be dropped during that time. And one of the things that we dropped were the fellowship luncheons that would take place once a month on Thursdays at noon. And we are getting ready to start that up again. So the first one is going to take place this coming Thursday, this week, in Murray Parlor. If you're available and can come just for a, uh, and, and bring a dish and a place setting uh, and yourself and whatever you would do, just for a time of fellowship together, we're looking forward to to being able to, to start doing that again. So we'll be here in Murray Parlor on Thursday. And, uh, and if you can get away, come on in. We'll spend about an hour, hour and a half together. Uh, there's really no other agenda but to pretend like we like each other, okay? And uh, so I'm looking forward to that and, and we'll let that take place at that time. And one final thing, uh, just to let you know that the office will not be open tomorrow. Uh, so the office will be closed tomorrow. Uh, the, uh, much of the church staff has been doing at it all, all the, through the week and weekend, and, and uh, so they will be, uh, we will all be off tomorrow morning. So I wanted you to know that. So did you get an opportunity, if you're sitting anywhere near where the red pads are, we, we don't announce this very often, but, uh, but the red pads are, are there not for, to make you miserable, uh, not to make you uncomfortable, but if you would just put your name on that, uh, and if you don't think that we have your address or phone number or something like that, or you're visiting with us and would like me to write to you, just any, any information you provide for that is greatly appreciated on that. So you do know that three years ago when we came together was the first Easter ever in which the church was pretty well empty. I stood here in this pulpit and I preached to the worship team. I think we had eight or nine people here in the in a sanctuary and I preached to eight or nine people. And of course it went out over the television and through social media and such. Feels really good to have you here. Once again, he has risen. He is risen indeed. Let's worship together.
Good morning. Happy Easter. Those that are able, would you please stand for this morning's call to worship? On this glorious Easter day, we have come to celebrate the greatness of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. On this great day, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. My sisters and brothers, let us rejoice. Alleluia. 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 Jesus is Lord of all the earth. He is risen creation. On this most holy of days, the one whom men have had thought to destroy has risen triumphant from the tomb. My sisters and brothers, let us rejoice. Alleluia. 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 Jesus has died and is risen. On this holy day, we celebrate our new life in the risen Christ. Through the death of Jesus, the weight of our sins have been lifted from us. Through his glorious resurrection, we have become sons and daughters of God. My sisters and brothers, let us rejoice. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Come, let us praise the living God. Joyfully sing to our Savior. Please remain standing for hymn 302, Christ the Lord is risen today. may be seated. Let me just say here very briefly that that song is written by Charles Wesley uh, in the founding of, of the Methodist movement. There are some 82 denominations around the world that relate back to the Methodist movement. Christ the Lord is risen today. Well, the ushers are going to wait upon you for their offerings and tithes.
God, we give you thanks that the greatest gift of all has been given, your son Jesus and the resurrection. And because of that, Lord, we bring back our gifts and we lay them at your feet with the great thanksgiving of the day. Use these gifts for your kingdom here and around the world, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Please remain seated for hymn 322, Up From the Grave He Arose. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we have gathered to celebrate, whether we are home or we're sitting here in the sanctuary. And Lord, we have so much to celebrate. We've gone through the Lenten season. We've gone through Holy Week with Monday, Thursday, and communion. And Good Friday and today we are here to celebrate. You have given us gifts, gifts of power and strength gifts of the Resurrection Sunday. And Lord, what would it be like if we thought that death was final? There would be no victory. You would not have rose from the grave and been here for us to give us unconditional love. And Lord, we are so thankful. 
We ask that you be with our pastor this morning. Be with him as he delivers the, the service and the, the sermon and the love that he wants to share with each one. Lord, each day you give us blessings. Some we recognize and some we don't. But you are so faithful and there to be with us. And so knowing that, Lord, we do ask that one day we might know peace, that we might be able to have the joy in our hearts of knowing that you reign. But for right now, Lord, we thank you that you gave us a prayer that we can pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I always appreciate um, whenever Jackie prays for the pastor, and I'm always afraid she's going to say someday, when we pray for a pastor, that he won't embarrass us today. Uh, but she never says that, and I appreciate that. So you may know that the Gospels, uh, all four Gospels speak to the resurrection. Uh, in Christmas time, there are two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, that speak to the birth of Jesus, but all the Gospels do for, for, uh, for Easter. And so for that reason, it was the women who first went to the tomb as well. And so I'm asking, uh, I'm asking Maria Giondi if she would be the one to read this Matthew passage to us today as we remember that the ladies were the first ones to the tomb. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath at the dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to, Gal to go to Galilee where they will see me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Maria. I've noticed over the years that when we get to Christmas, we tell the story of the birth of Jesus over and over and over again. The story is presented in decorations. The story of Jesus coming into this world is presented in, in programs, in the pulpit, in, in the communities many times. When we get to Easter, we celebrate Easter. It's a great day of celebration and a resurrection. But I wonder sometimes if we fail to tell the, the story about Easter, uh, enough. And, uh, and so really before I begin the rest of this message, I thought maybe I would give you what I call to be the Cliff Notes version of what happened at Easter time. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm still practicing this, by the way, but I, but I think it's, it's worth, worth hearing. Some of you have been in church every year since you've been born. I think I'm one of those. There may have been a year where mom and dad said, don't take them this week. You know, that might be, but I believe I've been uh, in church every Easter um, in my life. So here's a, oh, and I, and I think we need to repeat this again and again because so many have not heard. They know that Easter's out there. They've already had some chocolate, maybe some eggs, 
Uh, in fact, I asked one of the families on the way out the door today, do you have any chocolate at home? And the one little guy said, not anymore. <laughs> so here are the cliff notes. Jesus began his ministry in Cana of Galilee. Um, he also went down through into Judea, drew Samaria with his ministry, short trips through Samaria, but most of his ministry was contained in that area. Of course, he had compassion for people everywhere he taught. People thought he was a great teacher. He was a healer. They experienced many signs and wonders, so much so that even the Romans took notice. And when the Romans would take notice, so would the Sadducees and Pharisees, because the Romans were bound and determined to keep peace. The Sadducees and Pharisees knew that if someone were to raise up and get everyone to start following them, then the danger of that whole situation would be that they'd eventually want to rebel against the Romans. The Romans then would come in and crush, crush them, destroy the temple worship, and that favored position that the Sadducees and Pharisees had in their culture would be wiped out. After all, that kind of thing had happened in Israel's past, and, uh, and they were afraid that that might happen again. So the religious leaders were very tough on Jesus, and they were uncomfortable with him. So one of the disciples, named Judas, uh, began to work with the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, and, and began to work out a way in which Jesus could be arrested and taken out of the picture. So in the cover of night, they came in order to arrest Jesus. It was after the Last Supper, uh, and, uh, and it was, of course, then before, um, um, b before the... Um, the, the resurrection would take place before the, the trial happened. So they, they took him before uh, the Sanhedrin, and then they took him before Herod, and then they took him before Pilate. Pilate recognized that, that, that Jesus had done nothing deserving of death, but Pilate was also had one job, and that was to keep peace in, in Palestine. And in keeping peace in, in that particular area, the one job he had to do was, was, was uh, to, to accommodate where he could accommodate and to crush where he needed to crush. He chose to allow Jesus to be crushed in order to keep the peace in that area. For that reason, uh, the death of Jesus took place on the cross. Uh, that was on a Friday. Since the Jewish Sabbath began at sundown, he had to be buried by that time. So he was buried. Tomb was put uh, over the, the grave. There was concern that, that his disciples might come and steal the body and thus be able to proclaim what Jesus had said on the third day he would rise again. So a seal was put on that tomb. Um, then uh, all day Saturday, he was in the tomb and that was still part of the Sabbath. Then the Sabbath would end on Saturday night or evening at sundown. And uh, however, the first time that the women could do anything to prepare the body uh, to do the job of a funeral home, basically, would be on that, uh, that Sunday morning, the first day of the week. The ladies came. They found out that an earthquake had taken place. The stone was rolled back, and the angel was sitting at the stone. Now, that's the, the cliff notes. Uh, and, and I think sometimes that we need to, to remember it again and again. I didn't take time to talk about why it was that Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Passover and what that symbolism was. Maybe I'll back up and tell that part of it as well. They were there for the Passover, which harkened back to the days in which Israel was needing to, wanting to escape from Egypt. Ten, uh, nine, nine plagues had taken place at that time, and each plague, Pharaoh decided, now I'll let you go, and then he wouldn't. And so this final one was going to be the clincher. God was going to require the death of the firstborn of everyone in Egypt, the firstborn of all their cattle, the firstborn of all their livestock, the firstborn was going to be taken in their life. I, sometimes I do this just to get the idea of how drastic this was. How many firstborns are there here? You'd have been out of here, you know? If you're Egyptian, you'd be gone. So would the line that would come from you. This was an incredible judgment upon them. What God did for the Israelites so that the death angel would know to get the right one is that he had them prepare a Passover meal, uh, which they took a spotless lamb. If someone didn't have a, uh, enough to people to have 10 or so people, they were to invite another family or other individuals. And when the, the lamb's life was taken, 
the blood from that lamb was put over the, the lentil of their doorway, maybe even on some of the posts, so to speak. But that blood was assigned to the death angel to pass over them. They were under the protection of God himself uh, in that time. So that when that took place, that's exactly what happened. Death was at the door of the Egyptians, or those who did, not, uh, who did not celebrate the Passover meal and, uh, and, and have that meal together. So that's why when the Israel would remember that, Jesus and, and all kinds of people from literally around the unknown world would, would come into Jerusalem in order to observe that and remember that Passover meal. So the title of today's message is the cross, the tomb, and the stone. I don't think I've ever come up with any titles of sermons on my own. I believe I've borrowed, stolen, grabbed titles from everywhere and every one. Um, but I make no apology for that. Think about this. You have the luxury of going to hear anyone preach you want to preach. And many of you do go other places, I know. You have that luxury. Me, I have me. Can you imagine? You, th you, think that, you think that you get weary sometimes. Can you imagine what it's like listening to myself uh, when, 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 as the years go on in that? So I do listen to a lot of preaching and teaching. I read a lot of sermons. I, I, uh, and I've learned from some of the best there are out there, to be honest with you. And the cross, the tomb, and the stone is what I want to deal with today. All right, before we do, let's go over and take a look at the British Museum in, uh, in London. I believe it's in London. Uh, Neil McGregor is, uh, uh, is the curator of that, or was a curator for a long time. He and some of his pals decided that they would put together 100 objects that are, and artifacts that are in the, the British Museum, and they would tell the history, the story of the history of the world from those 100 objects. Uh, they, you know, they began by showing one of the mummies, uh, and, uh, and then they talked about what was going on in, in the world at that time. They went back also, and one of the episodes was to show a chopping tool, which they identified as 1.8 to 2 million, 2 million years old. I, I kind of have a beef with that type, of, uh, that type of timeline, but that's for another message and another time. But that's the way they did it. So they, they talked about it as if they know what was going on a couple million years ago, as if the, the earth and the creation was there for sure. And I know that if I keep going to this, I'll divide, it, I'll divide the congregation right down in half here. And I'm not going to do that here. It's not worth it today. He tells that. He continues to, continues to go through until he gets to finally, uh, oh, when he got to uh, 500 years before the time of Christ, they got out a gold coin. They have one of the uh, coins that's, that's of the king of Croesus, and uh, which was Lydia at the time, now Turkey. And it was the first minted gold coin that we have in the historical books. Uh, and was a pure and established the, the sense of purity for gold in a coin at that time. And so they talked about the economy that happened during that day. Uh, and you know how they finished up around 2002 is when this took place. You know what they finished up? The 100th object was a cell phone and told the history of the world by virtue of that particular object, a cell phone. But you know what? It does make me wonder how could you ever give the history of the world and not have one object that spoke to who Jesus was? Not one object do they include. You know, many, many churches will claim they have a piece of the cross and some of the, uh, some of the relics that, that they'll go by that. I, I don't spend much time worrying about that kind of thing at all, but many of them do. But how can you tell the history of the world and avoid the greatest historical record that ever took place, and that is Jesus on the cross? How can you tell the history of the world and skip the fact that the tomb uh, was where Jesus was laid, that Jesus died? We, we say that when we work on the, uh, you know, when we work on the Apostles' Creed, you know, uh, he was dead, really was gone. And how can you tell the history of the world without showing that the stone was rolled back, that the grave is empty? Hence, the title of this message, The Cross, the tomb, and the stone. It is central to history. If you remove that, if I can have that next slide, if you remove that, uh, any one of those things that I'm talking about here, um, then uh, from the history story, then the significance 
of world history goes downhill. Before I get back into the passage of scripture, let me show you one more book. Uh, some of you may remember D. James Kennedy. Uh, D. James Kennedy had written a book called What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? The reason that, that many of you will know who D. James Kennedy is, he's the one who uh, is a past, was the pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, and they had put together the program called Evangelism Explosion. And many of the folks in this congregation were trained how to share their faith in that, and many people were visited uh, at that particular time. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think we were telling the telling the story about, about uh, Debbie and Sandy, about your mother, I think, was visited by three members from Evangelical Explosion when she uh, first was in town and starting to come here during that time. So, uh, in fact, I even know the names of who they, they were. They, I know I read this one time. Uh, Gary Schaefer, Ann Leach, and Debbie Stahl, I believe, were the three that visited, visited your mom from Evangelical Explosion. Is there anyone here who who were part of that particular thing. I can think of one or two of you were part of Evangelism Explosion at that time. Yeah. Did I see two of you? And that's exactly how many were in the early service. Were you part of that, Joe, was that before your time? You had not seen the light yet by being here? Is it, that's... They were trained how to share their faith, but the biggest part of it was just asking the question just asking if, if people knew how, 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 one, uh, um, how, how one was saved, how, how one was, was brought into fellowship with God. And they learned to ask that question and they, and they learned to do it well. I have pastored two churches over the years that had evangelism explosion before I got to that church. And in both of those churches, there was an evangelical voice and a hunger for the scriptures and a thirst for Jesus that was different than many of the other churches that I've served. And uh, so I have a great deal of thanks for that. One of my favorite books, though, from, from D.J. Kennedy, I met him once. I, I, I was down in Florida, and I got myself to Flo Fort Lauderdale, and I got to the uh, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And he is handsome. I'm telling you, if I could look, he had a blue robe that was just about as, as fine looking as you could ever ask it. So I went to the evening service, the Sunday evening service, and at the end of it, he would go to the back, you know, one of those slanted floors. The pulpit there at Coral Ridge has one of those big hands that are covering, you know, a spiritual covering over you up at the top. It's pretty impressive. Uh, at the end of that time, he was at the back and I went and introduced myself to him. And at that time, I told him the congregation I was serving that how many of them had, had learned how to share their faith and that they were still doing so. And I remember thanking him at the time. And he was very gracious. He would never see me again, but he was very gracious in, in letting me express that to him. But what if Jesus had never been born? He wrote that book uh, in the early 2000s, I believe. It might have been the late 1990s. But he wrote that book, and, and he just went through one thing after another that described has been given because of Jesus in the world. Uh, he named it hospitals. He mentioned, he mentioned Western culture. He, he mentioned Eastern culture. He meant the missionary movement has taken place. He identified one thing after another, things in, in everyday life that I've never thought of that are completely because of the fact that Jesus came into the world and because he lived and died and rose again. D.J. Kennedy would, would be able to do that. So the first thing that the factor I think that we want to look at then about, uh, about Jesus then, uh, we're going to just begin with the cross. Uh, if you were here two months ago, if not, why not, by the way? If you were here two months ago, right before we started with Lent, we decided to count the crosses in here. That was a fun thing to do. In the early service, I think I looked to the Mott family and had them counting, and they counted, and I think they came up with about 900 crosses. They're counting hymns, they're counting hymn books, uh, they were counting uh, signs, any place where they could see a cross, uh, you know, in, in pews, up front, on the windows, in the lights, anything even in the design of this building that showed, showed a cross in some shape before they counted. They came up with somewhere around 900 of them, as I recall. But when I got to this service, uh, I, and so I had the opportunity for, for uh, Mackenzie, I think, was the one who counted here. And I wrote down on my, on my phone, uh, I wrote down on my phone, uh, Ms. Caldwell, that uh, I think you told me that you'd counted about 1,424, somewhere in there. 
It was about 1,400. You don't remember, so I can say any number I want to. Good. All right. Um, but she had counted, and, uh, and she had gotten 1,400 or more before she had left the building that particular day. We like crosses around here. The reason we like crosses is not for their beauty, uh, not for the material they're made out of. We like crosses because of the impact that took place. You know, the cross in Jesus' day was ugly, splintery, had stains on it from blood, body issues. The cross was ugly, but it was also beautiful. Um, not only is it, uh, not only is it, is it beautiful, it, it represents love and sacrifice for you and me, victory over sin and even death. When we use crosses, it offers forgiveness, reconciliation, hope. We love the cross. We feature it in this place of worship. We talk about it. How can you do the history of the world and not have an object of the cross in order to be able to talk about the impact that Jesus had on the world? That moves then, we move on to the tomb. I want to say something really profound, so I want you to listen to me. I, I, don't, want to have to I don't want to have to, anyone miss this, by the way. The tomb is what follows up the cross, by the way. But hear this out. And if there's anyone disagrees with me, I'm willing to argue with you. The tomb, are you ready? Is where you put dead people. I thought of that all by myself, by the way. <laughs> Jesus was dead when he was laid in that tomb. You know, there are all kinds of, all kinds of schemes out there, as people said, what had happened, what the disciples had done, where it would happen. He never really was put in that tomb. He never really did die. He was whisked away. No, the tomb is a reminder that Jesus died. Cold, alone, he died. And I, I think between the meaning of the cross and that tomb, remember he was put there on Friday before the Sabbath began and was there until Sunday, the first day of the week, whenever he came back up. But the reason that I want to emphasize the tomb is not for its shape, not for its size, not for anything else. The reason we emphasize the tomb is it is a place where the, the, the body of Jesus went through a transformation. How about that now? You know, Jesus raised other people from the dead. When you read the Gospels, you'll see that. Uh, in fact, you know, we, we, we read shortly before, that, uh, before this time how he'd raised Lazarus. He called him back again, who was in the grave. And uh, however, was, I just heard this, it's just a little distinction. Each person that he brought back from the dead uh, was resuscitated in some shape or form. Um, you know, at being resuscitated like that, they, they eventually had to die again. But the body of Jesus was something different. It was transformed. So much so that they kind of recognized Jesus and they didn't recognize Jesus. The scriptures in, in, in Paul in, the, in 1 Corinthians 15 talks about, about the imperishable or, or the perishable uh, being put in and, and the imperishable coming out. Jesus was transformed. Uh, and, and it's a really beautiful thing. So, so that's what the grave will do for you and me someday, by the way. When we finally are sown uh, like a seed in, in a tomb, in our grave, uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus, the, his death on the cross, the, the pain of our sins and the penalty for our sin uh, will create a a, a some type of a transforming that takes place, and I don't have to understand it to celebrate it. Some type of a transforming will take place, a new body, and will be raised up in eternity with all God. And that's the tomb. How can you talk about the history of the world without the transformation power that Jesus went uh, from the grave to life again? Finally, I mentioned the stone. Of course, it was rolled away. I think, I think we all know that. Uh, while the cross was meant for felons, the tomb was meant for anyone who was dead and needed to be laid there. 
in order to return to the ground. But the stone was what <laughs> separated the dead from the living. And you remember it, I know you've heard it, but I think I'll just say it again. Whenever Jesus was put in the tomb and the stone was rolled away, they put the, the Roman seal on that, which means under the penalty of death, no one could, could move that or open that up in any shape or form. And along comes an earthquake and the angel, and the angel rolls that back and the guards fell like dead men. I would have too, and you would as well. Fell like dead men. And, uh, and there's no record of them seeing Jesus come out. What the record is, in, in Matthew 28, is the only one of the Gospels that says that the angel was sitting there on top of the stone. I, I really identi I identify with that angel. I don't know his name. And you see, I called him his. You heard, you heard that in me, so I've already done that to you. I don't know the angel's name, but the angel sat on the stone, and when the women got there, when the soldiers were, were deathly afraid, and the women got there, each one that would come, he'd say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And he told the ladies, look in the tomb. Because he knew when they looked in the tomb, they would see nothing. And most likely they had been standing nearby whenever he was placed in the tomb, when Jesus was placed in the tomb, and when the stone was rolled in and sealed. He said, do not be afraid. Furthermore, he said, go back and tell the, uh, tell the brethren that, that, uh, that I'm alive, and, uh, and so, or that, that Jesus is alive. So later on when they're going back, then Jesus appears to them in his resurrected state. That's why we sing in the garden as well, where Jesus appears to Mary in the garden. Uh, and as, as he was walk, talking with her, she, she recognized that, that, that it was Jesus. He says, Mary, you know, it's, it's me. Um, the stone is rolled back so that we could see the transforming power of God in heaven. I, uh, and I can't help but think, how can the British Museum tell the story of the history of the world without an artifact that describes how Jesus was alive and the stone was rolled back. Um, I don't know, I, I, this is probably dangerous, but let me live dangerously. I, I've been listening to, I was listening to a news piece over the weekend, maybe some of you heard it. It was an interview of the, of the, uh, of the rapper, artist, uh, singer, uh, reality star named, I'm thinking about Black China. Have you, have you ever, Ever heard of her? I wouldn't recommend that you spend a lot of time watching her old things. But, uh, uh, but they had interviewed her because she had gone through a transformation and everyone finds it fascinating. To tell you how fascinating it is, I saw this interview on Fox and I saw this interview on TMZ. I think that pretty much covers some of the bases, wouldn't you agree? And both of them, in the, the, the ones interviewing are just astounded because they knew what it was. She, at, when she was 19, um, she and her mother could not afford to get her to college, so she began the exotic dancing. Uh, and then she started working with tattoos and fillers in every place that you can find to be filled. And, uh, and, and her body almost became like a caricature, a cartoon type of a figure. But she was also successful and, uh, and had a little bit of business sense. And so for about 15 years, she, she lived a life that, that just, uh, just w would be so different from what you and I would want for our children, to be honest with you. And finally, she, uh, she said in her spiritual journey, she began to work on her health. She also decided that she had never been baptized. Now, she doesn't talk about Jesus in, this, in the interviews that I've seen, but here's what she does say. She said, I agreed to baptism, and I know that that pastor that was working with her uh, really did talk about what Jesus had done and what baptism was going to mean. And, she, and they have a picture of her being baptized. When she goes under the water, comes back out, she says, Everything was different. She says, I decided to, to, uh, to follow God and to know God and, and to, to live for him. And she began reversing all her surgeries. She began, uh, she has nothing against tattoos, but some of the tattoos were downright offensive to God himself. And so she was having those removed and those doctored up and, and changed in that process. But what she really said that impressed me is that she says, I read the Bible all the time. And she says, I'm just learning about God. Something transformative happened whenever she was baptized at that point in time. God met her at the point of her need. And what's the symbolism of baptism? When we go under the water, we die to sin. It's like the old man, the old woman uh, dies at that point in time. When we come up out of there, we come up out with a, 
uh, with the desire of new life in Christ. And then I have, wait to see whether or not she learns how to be able to, to do a kind witness for the name of Jesus. We'll see what happens there. But a transformation was taken place in her life that's really pretty impressive. So this lady who goes by Black China went back to what her original name is that her mother had given her. Does any, do any of you know what that is? Her name is Angela White. So she has gone from using that Black China, C-H-Y-N-A, and I'm not afraid of you looking that up to, to see this particular witness. And she's gone back to her given name, which is Angela White. She says that she's in a path now uh, to read the Bible and to basically let the transforming power of God continue to work in her life. All right. What about you? I'm not trying to make Angela White to be the, the hero because we don't know how all that's going to turn out. And, uh, but I think it's pretty impressive what what God does to anyone who, who recognizes that there's transformation that takes place in the tomb as we become perfected somehow before God. And I wanna know if you're in that transformation process right now. Do, can you say that, that you're allowing the transforming power of the resurrected Jesus Christ to work in your life? Yay or nay? You know the answer, you don't have to wait for anyone else to tell you one way or the other. The invitation today is to let that happen. If you've never asked Jesus to be the leader of your life, today's the day. Say, Lord, I believe that you, Jesus, are the Son of God. I believe that you died and paid the price for my sin. I believe that, that, uh, that not only did you pay that price for me, but that I'm trusting you for that forgiveness. And I'm inviting you to be the leader of my life as well as the forgiver of my sins. And then watch the transforming power of the cross, the tomb, the empty tomb, and the stone that's rolled away. See what God will do in your life. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to close with great song that I think I've probably been singing since I was a child. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. He lives. And, and Patty has one job here. She has one job when she plays a song to keep you and me from slowing her down when she plays a song. So I want to invite you to stand as we sing He Lives.
risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen Go with the good news. You are the announcement. You are the empty grave. You are the ones that people will see. Go and, and, and announce that good news in Jesus' name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.